Thank you, Edouard, for this introduction and for inviting me and uh, organizing this uh, nice colloquium. So I'm, tr I'm going to try to uh, uh, convince you to stay until the end of uh, this uh, very interesting day. Uh, so I'm going to talk about general, our general understanding and what we learned uh, about uh, the climate variability over the last millennium, relying on both observation and climate model. I'm going to try to be general, since uh, uh, we have a wider audience here and not everybody is expert in the field. So I'm going to try to swing back and forth between general terms and the more specific uh, concept uh, related to our uh, field of, of research. So why uh, do we work on this period, climate period? And most importantly, what do we want to model? So we have seen like several presentations during the, this morning and the, the first presentation of the, the afternoon with these classic plots showing uh, recent observation, instrumental satellite observation uh, since uh, the last uh, 150 years, uh, a few records, the longest records in Europe, starting with the invention of the thermometer in uh, around uh, 1650, which shows us that the climate of the Earth has warmed as a global average of about one degree Celsius. And, we, and when we put that uh, climate change, global warming, into perspective, we have to rely, as has been presented earlier today, uh, on an uh, indirect indicator relating on uh, historical document and climate indicators relying on tree rings, for example, or lake sediment, etc., to uh, deduce climate variation over the last century. And when we do so, we see like uh, several things. First of all, the early part of the millennium was warmer. Uh, that's what we call the medieval climate anomaly or medieval warm uh, climate, depending on, on the terms uh, that you want to uh, use. And this warm period has been followed by a colder period, which contrasts uh, with a colder temperature of about one degree Celsius, uh, starting around, depending on the, the reference and the region, uh, 15, 450 down to uh, the beginning of the global warming period that we are living in today. So identifying uh, the mechanism that control and that explain this transition, this multi-century scale variability is a real challenge. And for Muller, it's very important to be able to reproduce these kind of changes if we want to uh, project future climate variations. So first of all, why does climate vary? Because in the end, that's the key question we all want to address. I want to give a few basic elements before going further, because most of uh, the talks previously have talked about forcing natural climate variability, but what is that, in fact, natural climate variability? So we have to uh, define a first element which uh, corresponds to the internal variation. So climate can vary internally, and it results, in fact, uh, from spontaneous exchange of heat and momentum between the ocean and the atmosphere. And this uh, spontaneous uh, internal variation will uh, organize itself around modes of climate variability that are internal to the climate system, and that will vary depending on the dynamical regional context. Uh, a, 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 an emblematic example of such internal mode of variability is El Niño, or El Niño Southern Oscillation, that all of you probably know, which um, uh, has been observed for more than 100 years because we have a, a observed sea surface temperature records in the equatorial Pacific uh, for a long time period. Here is just a focus over the uh, last uh, uh, 60 uh, years or so, 70 years. And uh, this uh, uh, phenomenon uh, corresponds to an, uh, an oscillation between warm sea surface temperature in uh, equatorial central Pacific here that is often followed by a cold uh, situation. The warm events are called El Nino and the uh, cold events are called La Nina. And this oscillation occurs spontaneously and results uh, from uh, coupled ocean atmospheric uh, 
uh, processes in the equatorial Pacific. And you don't need any intervention of external forcing of any sort to obtain this uh, internal mode of variability. And this oscillation occurs quite frequently. It's an internal mode of variability, and we switch from a warm to a cold phase every two to seven years, uh, roughly. This is for the Pacific Ocean, but uh, another example of an internal mode of variability is uh, uh, in uh, the Atlantic Ocean. You all probably uh, know about this uh, Atlantic Meridional Ocean Circulation, which basically corresponds to a cone variable between warm water that are drifted by uh, wind stress towards higher latitudes, where they cool and uh, mix with colder water coming from uh, the uh, uh, polar region from the uh, uh, Arctic Ocean. And when they cool, they get also saltier because w the warm water coming from the tropics are salty. Deep water, for deep water formation occurs. Water sinks to the bottom of the ocean and then recirculates toward the South Atlantic. And this conveyor belt um, is also a mode of variability that is organized specifically in the Atlantic Ocean. And this mode is very much lower frequency. It varies spontaneously from uh, decades to decades and century to century. This is actually the slowest mode of uh, internal climate variability. So now, external forcings. We have uh, several factors that can alter this internal mode of variability and interact with it. We have mentioned, we have heard about volcanic eruption this morning, solar irradiance, and greenhouse gases. So the first two, all of those uh, factors can be natural, are natural. Um, CO2 greenhouse gases can vary also naturally. And uh, during the uh, since the beginning of the industrial period, we are acting on this natural forcing and increasing its concentration in the atmosphere. So how a volcanic eruption uh, works, I'm going to go quickly on this. Basically, volcanic eruption inject uh, 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 sulfur gases high in the atmosphere. Usually, tropical eruptions have a global impact. A large tropical uh, eruption have a, a global impact because when the uh, ga gases reach the stratosphere, they are converted in aerosol, sulfate aerosol, which have, a, which have a very strong albedo, and they are quickly spread all over the globe. So they, they, they work as a, a, shed, a shed to uh, the incoming solar radiation. So we basically block the sun uh, light, and this uh, induces a cooling for a few years, which basically corresponds to the lifetime of the aerosol in the atmosphere. Usually it takes two to three years before they are washed out and like uh, scavenged out of the atmosphere by falling uh, into uh, the higher latitudes over uh, both hemisphere. Here this is an example for Pinatubo eruption, which is the only big eruption, stratospheric tropical big eruption that is well observed that occurred during the satellite era. And uh, we had, we observed a cooling of about half a degree following, following Pinatubo eruption, which occurred in June 1991 in uh, the Philippines. So we heard also about sunspot and sun variability. I won't expand much uh, on this, but there, uh, the sun variability can vary on various time scale, a high frequency time scale. That's what we observed here over the um, satellite uh, era. On top of this high frequency, we have also like lower frequency that is organized around 11 year solar, solar cycles. And the amplitude, uh, as has been said earlier today, is smaller as compared to, uh, the variation is smaller as compared to the impact of volcanic forcing. I'll come back to that later. Now, if we look at the uh, evolution of global temperature over the historical period, global average temperature that is observed, we see several things. We see first a warming trend so of about one degree Celsius that we tend to attribute to uh, anthropogenic forcing. And on top of this global warming trend, we see a lot of variations. Some of those variations are purely due to internal variability, like El Nino events, for example. Extreme, two extreme El Nino events occurred uh, during this period, the 82, uh, 83, and 97, 98 extreme uh, El Niño event, and uh, such events usually have a global impact through atmospheric te teleconnection. Warming in the equatorial Pacific tend to alter the global atmosphere circulation and propagate the, anom the anomalous warming um, over larger areas over the globe, and that's why we can detect it 
at a global average. At global average, we can see the imprint of an event that occurred in the equatorial Pacific. And we also identify the cooling of about half a degree following Pinatubo eruption in 91. So how do we know that the global warming trend is entirely or mostly due to um, men uh, activity, anthropogenic activity, because maybe that could be due to uh, only internal variability. And that's uh, a question that uh, has been a deba debate actually for many years before like, settling to a consensus, at least uh, for most of the modern countries, let's say. Uh, we have many observations. Here, this is the global warming trend, global temperature that I just shown before. And if we see it in another perspective with uh, average from decades to decades, we can see that the recent decades has been the warmest on record, instrumental record. And the global fingerprint of the, uh, of the warming is also quite homogeneous. It's warming everywhere, mostly. And if we look at other like, uh, parameters, like the snow uh, cover in spring in northern hemisphere or the Antarctic summer sea ice, we see also, while the, global, the, 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 the climate temperature is increasing all over the globe, the amplification of the, 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 the sea ice tends to respond. And we have less and less sea ice. The ice is shrinking more and more. Here is in 82, the ice cover, and here in, in 2012. And uh, this shrinking of sea ice tends to amplify the, the, the global warming uh, impact by uh, reducing the albedo, because the sea ice have a strong albedo. So the less sea ice you have, the more heat uh, stays into the system. And that's why we tend to have a, a stronger warming over the uh, polar region of the northern hemisphere. So the climate change is real, and uh, again, uh, how do we know that we are causing it? So that's when studying the last millennium becomes very interesting, because we need to put in perspective the recent observed changes uh, with period where we had no human activity, so we can measure the uh, natural ranges of climate variability uh, when we didn't have uh, increased greenhouse gas emission into the atmosphere or defor massive deforestation, for example. And for that, we need to um, rely on indirect measurement, first of all, of uh, greenhouse gases themselves. The most powerful greenhouse gases are the, green, uh, the CO2, the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, met methane and uh, nitrous dioxide. And uh, here this is uh, a record that you have already seen earlier today of the concentration in the atmosphere uh, as reconstructed by analyzing uh, ice core in Antarctica, the uh, bubble trapped in ice core. And we can see that uh, the beginning of uh, the anthropogenic era, there is a steady increase of the concentration of these gases starting uh, early, like 200 years ago. And before this period, it's quite flat. There is not so many strong changes. The levels are quite stable. So this is a perfect taste base to evaluate climate variability in models and evaluate the natural ranges of this climate variability as simulated by model and as reconstructed by proxy record. So we need, uh, of course, to have reliable uh, uh, reconstruction of the other known forcing that are natural, like volcanic eruptions. I won't expand much on this, but there are also uncertainties in reconstructing the forcing. We have seen this morning a lot of discussion about the uncertainties in reconstructing climate uh, variable like surface temperature or hydrological cycle. But uh, the forcings also have, have to be reconstructed and they also rely on the analysis of uh, chemical parameter in uh, various archives. Volcanic forcing is basically deduced by analyzing sulfate deposition in polar ice cores uh, in Greenland and uh, in uh, Antarctica. And uh, by analyzing the spikes of, of uh, sulfate uh, in uh, both ice cores, if we find uh, a match in terms of timing in the spike in Ant Antarctica and in Greenland, we know that the eruption was tropical and it was strong. It was tropical because it injected uh, 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 gases in the lower uh, stratosphere in the tropic, 
And from there, those gases were converted into uh, aerosol, sulfate aerosol droplet. And in the stratosphere, the, the atmospheric circulation tend to homogenize and redistribute the aerosol all over the globe. And they usually fall and scavenge and, uh, on both uh, polar region, Greenland and Antarctica. So if we, want, if we find evidence of spike at the same time, then that means that the eruption was tropical. And that's using this method. Uh, uh, we are able, uh, there are several reconstructions here. This is uh, the uh, volcanic forcing reconstructed for the last millennium and used for the CEMIP-5 exercise, but there are uh, updates of this reconstruction for the upcoming CEMIP-6 exercise. But basically we see the anomaly of uh, volcanic uh, radiative forcing associated to those cluster of eruption all over that uh, like um, occurred all over the last millennium. Pinatubo is somewhere here. And we see that the uh, large eruption occurred, much larger eruption occurred, uh, about like uh, with an amplitude of about 20 what is square meter in terms of radiative forcing uh, during uh, several centuries uh, over the last millennium. So there are two reconstructions with uncertainty. And solar radiance, of course, uh, Edouard has discussed uh, that this morning in the introduction of the conference this, uh, today. We have actually six reconstructions, and I'm pretty sure I'm missing a few ones. This, figures, uh, this figure is uh, from uh, the last uh, IPCC reports. So there are issues because there are those uh, reconstructions are deduced from cosmogenic isotope, barium-10 in ice core and carbon cathodes, uh, 14 in uh, tree rings. Cosmogenic mean, means that uh, their um, concentration will depend uh, on solar activity. And uh, based on this measurement, the solar cycle are deduced by calibration to satellite observations. However, there are large uncertainty related to the background component. We don't know how large it is, especially during the mounder minimum. And uh, we need also to uh, see that, uh, to analyze that the 11 year solar cycle, which dominates basically the variability, low frequency variability of the solar radiance, the amplitude can be um, stronger or weaker depending on the reconstruction you use. So, we need to, to remember that we need also to explore the range of uncertainty in the forcing uh, when comparing uh, the uh, results of climate model to uh, the range of uncertainty in the climate reconstruction based on, on proxies. So now, which is doing what? We have volcanic forcing, solar irradiance, human activity before the industrial period was quite uh, uh, quiescent, quiet. Uh, so. Climate model can help us address uh, these issues. So climate models are basically a, a, a few words, just general few words. Uh, we, we, we are basically trying to simulate the dynamics of the ocean, the atmosphere, the clouds, etc., that we have observed over the last uh, 70 years or more since the beginning of the satellite era and before. We know we, there are laws of physics and dynamics, and that's what we try to formalized from, uh, through equation. Not everything is explicitly computed. We have also approximations, which we call parametrization. And we try to um, calculate the climate using supercomputers. So by doing so, we cut the Earth into small cubes. And in each cube, we try to resolve the equation. And uh, so we have the atmosphere, we have the ocean, we have the orography, we have uh, the land cover, vegetation, etc. And everything is computed interactively to simulate the climate as we think we, we understand it and we know it. Uh, these kind of models are uh, the most complex one. We call them the general circulation models, coupled ocean atmospheric general circulation model. And now we call them Earth system model because we include more and more processes in those model like uh, dynamic, dynamic vegetation, interactive uh, uh, ice sheets, etc. So these models have been used in se the several like um, um, families of uh, IPCC reports to evaluate the impact of uh, human activity on the decadal to century scale climate change. So, for example, over the historical period. This, uh, the black curve is the uh, global temperature warming 
um, uh, observation that I've, seen, I've shown you earlier. If we use those uh, climate models, so all uh, groups all over the world uh, did the same experiments and simulated the climate, including only the known natural forcing, let's say volcanic eruption and solar radiance, to uh, try to see whether we were able to explain the observed change. And we see that we can uh, maybe explain the cooling following volcanic eruption and things like that, but we don't uh, capture the trend, global warming trend. However, if we add up uh, tropospheric, uh, anthropogenic forcing, like greenhouse gases, tropospheric aerosol, etc., so human activity, the models are able to get most of the like, signal that is new, uh, due to a known forcing. Uh, each curve is uh, um, an experiment from a model uh, simulation. So we are able to reproduce the cooling following most of the um, uh, big eruption of the historical period, there were five. And we, most importantly, are able to simulate the global warming trend. So now if we try to um, put in perspective these changes and see whether the range of the trend can be reproduced also naturally without involving any anthropogenic forcing and uh, evaluate uh, the time of emergence as, as, mentioned, uh, as Edouard has mentioned earlier today, we can enlarge the time window and try to simulate the whole like 1,000 years. So we, we started to work on this subject a few years ago <coughs> and uh, at IPSL. These results are consistent with uh, what has been done uh, uh, in other modeling group. And we try to explore the uncertainty in the known external forcing. Just to sum up, in this first experiment, we uh, try to evaluate only the influence of this solar irradiance scenario, the red curve, uh, and the CO2 curve that uh, is deduced from ice core. So this solar irradiance scenario is uh, one of the scenario that has the strongest amplitude in the trend. Uh, respectively to the uh, solar uh, minima, the modern solar minima, and the mounder minimum minima, which is about 0.25%. Uh, there is a strong uh, trend in this reconstruction. And imposing this solar radiance curve and this uh, CO2 curve, the blue line here, into the IPSL coupled uh, Earth system model, and also uh, orbital uh, forcing, which is quite weak, and doesn't change much. Uh, this is the result we obtain. This is the red curve. And uh, the shading in the background is the overlap of a reconstruction that you have already seen. Basically, it's um, uh, showing a, a warmer uh, early period in the millennium, followed by the little ice age in the northern hemisphere, and the warm uh, recent uh, period. And uh, the red curve, including the solar uh, strong uh, forcing and the CO2, is able to reproduce something that looked like a, a, a warm medieval period followed by a little ice age and then a global uh, warming, uh, a warming uh, after. If we don't put any forcing in the, the same model and simulate, uh, make a simulation of 1,000 years, this is the green curve, we don't have at all uh, any signal. We have decadal variation, but the low frequency multi-century scale variability is not captured, which means that uh, internal variability alone is not able to uh, simulate the MCA, the warm medieval climate anomaly, uh, and the little ice age. This is uh, already a first answer. Anyway, so the, the reconstruction, uh, the simulation is within the range of reconstruction, however, we see uh, several things. For example, the warm medieval anomaly uh, starts uh, 200 years later in our simulation as compared to uh, the reconstruction. There is a better agreement with, uh, for the transition to the little ice age, though. However, this curve is not the most up-to-date reconstruction. Uh, as I said earlier, there was a lot of debate about uh, the amplitude uh, of the background. Um, the most recent reconstruction, at least that are being used now for CENIPS 
six and that was being used for semi uh, suggest that there was not such a long trend in the solar irradiance. And uh, the variability was mostly dominated by, by 11 year solar cycle only and not such a strong trend. So we tried to explore this uh, second set of solar radiance uh, variability, and this time we included volcanic eruption. So this is the, uh, uh, the solar radiance that most groups uh, use for the semi-5 exercise that was produced by uh, Vieira and Quarter. So it's mostly dominated by 11-year solar cycle. There is not such a strong trend in the, between the, the minimum, minimum, mandar minimum and the, the recent minima. Actually, it's 0.1% as compared to 0.25% in the previous reconstruction. If we compare the anomaly in the watt per square meter related to this solar radiance, total solar radiant variability to the volcanic forcing provided by Gao, we see that this is nothing. This is very small as compared to volcanic eruption in terms of amplitude. So if we impose this forcing, just look at this blue curve. The red curve was the previous one. The blue curve is the one using, that was done for semi-5 with the IPSL model using the most, uh, the recommended forcing. We, we see the, the green curve is the control run. So without any forcing, it's still flat. There is no signal. And interestingly, we can see that we are able to simulate a period that was warmer at the beginning of the millennium and then colder during the Little Ice Age before getting, uh, I didn't finish the, the simulation because it start, stopped in 1800, but the, warm, the, the climate is warming after. So this means that without taking into account a strong trend uh, in the solar radiance forcing, and using mostly volcanic forcing, this is the strongest forcing basically, we are able to get something that looks like a, a MCA and LIA transition. This red curve was basically responding directly to the imposed solar radiance, basically an earth balance model response. You don't need to have a 3D GCN to obtain this curve. You increase the solar constant, you decrease the solar constant, you warm, you cool. So, basically impose the, the signal, the response, into the forcing. However, this is more tricky to understand the blue curve. So we tried to understand why we, we got this uh, transition. So a few words first into uh, the analysis of the fingerprint of the solar irradiance variability on climate. Here I'm showing uh, the coherence between the solar irradiance variability with uh, Temperature anomaly in the northern hemisphere, average. Uh, cease to fast temperature in the North Atlantic, average. And the intensity uh, of the Atlantic meridional uh, ocean circulation, its maximum intensity. And we can see there is a, a, a black curve here, which uh, shows the 11 year of, uh, period, that there is um, some sort of a consistency or significance uh, uh, in terms of uh, spectrum variation between the solar radiance and the, uh, the 11 year solar cycle in the total solar radiance and the variability in those three climate variables, which could suggest a causal effect between the 11 year solar cycle and uh, the response into, those, uh, into the temperature of the northern hemisphere, SST, and uh, the AMOC. However, if you do the same plot with the control run, you will obtain the same signal, which means that here the correlation is spurious. There is internal mode of variability that also have 11 year solar cycle that are internal to the climate system. And this correlation is basically due to a resonance between this cycle and the internal dynamic. So that's, I, I showed it to just uh, emphasize that using correlation doesn't mean that there is a, a physical causal link and you need to really understand the dynamics of the system to make a proper interpretation. So this result is basically spurious. So we can't really attribute this variability in the model to the solar 11 year solar cycle. So now if we try to go deep further and, do, uh, and compute LILA correlation with the northern hemisphere average temperature with solar radiance in blue and volcanic forcing in red, uh, 
Here, this is um, uh, for uh, northern hemisphere temperature and SST in North Atlantic, sea surface temperature in North Atlantic. Uh, here, the variable climate variable leads, and here, the lag. We can see that uh, there is a, a significant, the dots, it's when it's significant, when the uh, SST and the surface temperature leads the 11 year solar cycle, which doesn't make any sense, so it's not uh, physically relevant. However, and the amplitude is very weak, it's uh, less than 0.2 degrees Celsius. However, the temperature response is much stronger when you consider the lead lag correlation with the volcanic forcing, and it's um, maximum about a year after the volcanic eruption, and uh, it's about uh, point more than 0.6 degrees Celsius, so it's computed over the whole millennium simulation. And uh, in North Atlantic, it's uh, cooling about 0.5 degrees Celsius. And the persistence of the signal is about 15 years. So volcanic eruption have a significant impact on uh, northern hemisphere temperature and uh, SST in North Atlantic, with a cooling of about an average point, more than uh, 0.5 degrees Celsius, and it lasts significantly about 10 years long. So these results are illustration, but they are uh, in agreement with the, 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 the results that uh, were summarized in the last IPCC report and, and uh, uh, work that uh, detection attribution work done by Andrew Schurer and co-author in 2014, which have shown that uh, the uh, most important dominant uh, forcing over the last millennium is uh, the, the volcanism. It's mostly detected uh, in uh, the PMIP3 simulation as compared to uh, reconstruction. Uh, the solar irradiance played a role, but it's difficult to detect uh, at the uh, hemisphere scale. And uh, uh, this tends to challenge an explanatory paradigm for the IPCC IR4, uh, from the IPCC IR4, which tended to attribute the transition between the medieval climate anomaly and the little ice age to solar irradiance. But this uh, First uh, experiments were relying on the stronger forcing. It's still on the table because we don't have direct observation. So maybe the, the truth lies in between. But there is more and more emphasis to, uh, toward the volcanism because at least it's, uh, the, the, the uncertainty is, is not as strong. It's still, there is uncertainty, but it's not as strong. So now why uh, volcanic forcing uh, in uh, our experiments tended to facilitate uh, or um, could explain at least the transition between the MCA and LIA, since this is the main uh, forcing that uh, dominate the variability in our experiment and in PMB3 model experiments. So we tried to uh, cluster the moderate eruption that occurred during the minimum through a superimposed composite analysis that is shown here. So when I say moderate, is the, of the size of Pinatubo. They were much stronger eruption, but we, if we cluster um, the, the eruption of the size of Pinatubo, which uh, induced a, a, a decrease of a solar irradiance of about five, five watts per square meter in average. The gray curve is the individual eruption and the red curve is the average. Uh, so the radiative, the reduction of the radiative forcing is uh, short-lived, about two years, which is uh, the lifetime of the aerosol in the stratosphere before they are washed out. And here this is uh, the response uh, in terms of surface temperature and here in water vapor. So. It's consistent with the lead lag correlation that, that I showed earlier. We obtain a cooling of about uh, more than half a degree Celsius, and it lasts about here for this moderate uh, eruption five years. And here we can see the water vapor response uh, for the same cluster of eruption, and we can see that um, the uh, this water vapor response scaled quite well in timing and peak amplitude with the surface temperature. And we tend to forget that the water vapor response is, a strong, is the strongest uh, greenhouse gases. And if we have to look at uh, a physical mechanism explaining volcanic eruption and the transition between the medieval climate anomaly and the ice age, that's the first suspect that you want to investigate, I would say. So, why that? I mean, if we go back quickly to uh, Pinatubo eruption, 
because it's a model, we have data, we have observation, so we can at least evaluate the physical mechanism compared, comparing the response following uh, this spinner tubo eruption towards observation. Here, this is the same model. This is an ensemble of experiments, so we repeated the same experiment, adding noise at the beginning, and we simulated uh, the response imposing the volcanic forcing for pinna tubo eruption in our model. This is 91, this is 95, the eruption occurs in June. The black curve are the uh, individual member, the thick black curve, the ensemble mean, and the red curve, the observation. So the model is able to capture and reproduce the cooling global average that followed uh, peanut tubo eruption, let's say. It's in agreement uh, with that. So the forcing radio the eruption occurred in June. The forcing radiative peak occurs at the end of the year of the eruption. The maximum cooling tend to uh, occur uh, a bit later, the, the year after. And if you look at the water vapor concentration between the surface and the lower troposphere, basically the surface and 300 hectopascal, and average it, you see that the, uh, the water vapor changes um, are la uh, last um, a bit longer, and maximum are maximum uh, like at the same time as temperature eruption, but last until April '93. So there is some sort of persistent persistence in the water vapor anomaly following the cooling uh, induced by the volcanic eruption. So now, if we look at the changes um, uh, during that period, during uh, ap uh, since April '93, '92 to uh, let's say '93, to April to December '92, sorry, and we uh, compare the response uh, in the observation reanalysis. This is the latitude, and this is the altitude uh, in percentage, and we look at the change in water vapor percentage we see that the decrease of water vapor is strongest in the upper troposphere of about 10%. This is in percent here, because uh, the lower troposphere is saturated with water vapor. So uh, a small cooling, we tend to reduce the water vapor concentration in low level, but it won't be as strong because it's saturated. However, at upper level, which is drier, a small cooling, we have a stronger impact. A reduction in the solar radiation will have a stronger impact. And we can see it here if we plot the uh, percentage. And if we compare the same thing, the, this to the result from our model experiment, we <coughs> have something consistent. So wh what is shown here is the fact that the, the cooling induced by the reduction of shortwave radiation will basically amplify the radiative cooling, so reduce the greenhouse ga gas effect. Um, we uh, reduce the atmosphere opacity at higher level, so we have uh, we lose more infrared, basically. So we are acting on the greenhouse gas effect. So now if we look at the cluster of eruption that occurred around the 13th century, just to understand what, what uh, happened here, this is the, the radiative cooling for following Samalas eruption in uh, 1257. And this eruption was massive. And the particularity of this cluster event is that they are decadally spaced. They are like, this is a, 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 a phenomenon that occurred starting uh, in the 13th century. It was quite quiet in the Middle Ages. And then there is this period where you have a, a several cluster of eruption, eruption followed by um, a decade. And if you look at the surface temperature response, there is a first cooling. The radiative forcing relaxes after two years, but the warming, the recovery takes much longer. And this is basically due to the water vapor feedback. The ocean plays a role, obviously, here. The ocean has a, a weaker uh, heat capacity, so it's, uh, it cools and it, may, it, make, uh, it takes a longer time to recover from the cooling. So the evaporation decreases, the greenhouse gas uh, uh, effect reduces, and this translates uh, this to a global climate response. So the impedance or the recovery time scale is permitted by this reduction of the greenhouse gases. And uh, before the climate anomaly reach values uh, 
that are close to those pre uh, preceding the eruption, you have another event. So the, the system is maintained towards colder condition, and then another eruption, another eruption. So basically, uh, the water vapor feedback transmits the intervolutional forcing, volcanic forcing, to longer time scale, and that's how short-lived radiative cooling can result in a longer-term climate response. So another way to summarize it, this is the short wave um, anomaly, so, so solar energy coming uh, from um, the sun, and uh, there is, this is a reduction following the cluster of eruption, and here this is the uh, radiative cooling due to the greenhouse effect, and the net uh, results just show that you have destabilized the Earth's balanced energy system due to this cluster of eruption. So these uh, processes uh, could be, at least in our model, is at work. But there, are, there has been other studies trying to explain the transition between the medieval climate anomaly and the Little Ice Age, and that was published by Miller and co-author in 2012, who invoked another mechani mechanism uh, stating that the volcanic cooling tended to Amplify, to be amplified by the sea ice cover response. You cool the system, you uh, melt less sea ice, so you uh, amplify and you form more sea ice, you amplify the albedo effect, and you also alter the ocean circulation in the Atlantic, and uh, by reducing the intensity of the uh, heat transport by the ocean circulation toward high latitude, you will maintain the system into a colder condition over the northern hemisphere. This involves a dynamical uh, process. What we suggest here is more like a simple like energy balance uh, process. You don't need to uh, invoke the dynamics. Basically, you cool the earth, you cool the, the ocean surface, which tends to make, take longer time to recover. You reduce the evaporation. You uh, basically uh, de decrease the greenhouse uh, gas effect and maintain the climate into a colder system. So maybe those two mechanisms played a key role uh, to explain the transition between the you know, medieval climate anomaly and the ice age. So now, if we look at the global fingerprint uh, of this anomaly during the uh, medieval climate anomaly and the little ice age, we, we heard a, a few comments in the previous talks regarding the, f the, the fingerprint or the signature um, uh, typical uh, of the medieval climate anomaly is saying that it's um, warming everywhere. It's not that clear. I mean, if you uh, plot, uh, this is a, a result published in 2009. There are more work that has been done since then, but I think this remains true. <coughs> what uh, is different between the medieval anom climate anomaly and the global recent uh, climate period, warm period, is the fact that here it's really global. During this period, it's more patchy. For example, here it's colder in the equatorial Pacific uh, during the medieval climate anomaly. So what happened during uh, this period is probably more the results, the fingerprint of the teleconnection of natural mode of variability, like El Nino or any climate mode of variability, altered by external forcing. It's not a global warming. I just wanted to make that comment. So now if we go towards... Um, the other region, as I said, this is still from Man et al. in 2009. This is a, a reconstruction of temperature anomaly for the northern hemisphere evolution since 500, the year 500 to the recent period. We've, we see, we locate here the medieval climate anomaly, which was warmer, the ice age. And interestingly, while it was warmer mostly in the northern hemisphere, if we look at the Nino 3 index as reconstructed by a man and co-author in the Pacific Ocean, it was colder. So while the northern hemisphere was warmer, the Pacific Ocean was colder. And interestingly, the transition between uh, the warm uh, climate anomaly and the little ice age in the Pacific Ocean is uh, characterized by a stronger amplitude in the decodal variability of uh, the uh, El Nino event. Stronger decodal variability, uh, and stronger amplitude. So this, uh, I think, is a, an important uh, point to make. Uh, the changes during the last millennium are not uniform. Uh, 
and depend on the very specific depending on the region we consider. Because the main mode of variability that dominates in each region will respond differently to the external forcing and evolve differently. So here I looked quickly at the, uh, the same uh, um, parameter in uh, our experiment. Here I plot the volcanic forcing during uh, uh, the mostly mo the, the last thousand years, I mean until 1500. Here this is in gray the Nino, the Nino 3 index, which basically shows uh, an Nino variability. In blue, in the red, this is a three-year running average. And uh, in uh, blue, uh, 20 years spline, basically a smoothing. So we see that there is uh, internal variability that is uh, still acting and uh, operating during the millennium in our experiment. But on top of that, there is a transient cooling during uh, this period due to the cluster of eruption that occurred in the 13th century. So on top of this cooling, transient cooling, El Nino southern oscillation was still active. So now if we remove this blue curve to this gray curve, so if we detrend to concentrate only on uh, internal variability and remove the transient climate change during the 13th century, this is what we obtain. So we, we see that there is still El Nino southern oscillation occurring. And uh, if we smooth, we see that there is a stronger decadal variability of um, um, around uh, El Nino variability during the 13th century. So, and this is not completely inconsistent with the reconstruction. So maybe there is something to dig in here. Maybe this uh, stronger amplitude of the El Nino variability at the time timescale was forced by volcanic eruption. So maybe I'm gonna shift this and um, and uh, the link between El Nino and volcanic forcing is not new. There has been a, a lot of work uh, in based on reconstruction and model showing that uh, here, for example, based on a 700 year century reconstruction of Nino uh, index here based on uh, tree rings and uh, a few corals, um, they try to explore the uh, response to El Nino southern oscillation to volcanic eruption. During those 700 years, there were about 30 large volcanic eruption. So the sampling is large enough so that you can um, draw like robust statistics, and that's the result here. They plotted in uh, this work uh, the SST anomaly in uh, this region. Uh, zero is the year of the eruption six years before, six years after. So what they show is that the year of the eruption, you have a, a, a cooling, and the year after, you have a, a warming that is uh, significant. We observe also that for the historical period, volcanic eruption. For example, there were five volcanic eruption, large volcanic eruption in the tropics during the historical period, so for, where, for which we have observation. Krakatoa in 80. 83, Santa Maria in 81, Angung in uh, 63, Achishan in 82, and Pinatubo in 81. And if we do a superimposed epoch analysis for uh, uh, overlapping uh, the uh, optical depth parameter for each of these eruption, the optical depth is basically the measure of the timing and magnitude of the volcanic eruption. So Pinatubo here, the light blue started in June and was as strong as the other one. Here, for example, Krakatoa was the oldest one and occurred in August. And here this is the SST response in the Nino 3.4 region for the individual eruption with the same color code. And the black curve here is the uh, average, ensemble average of uh, this individual event. And we can see that uh, there is a significant uh, warming, and four out of five eruptions were uh, synchronous with the uh, El Nino event, uh, which correspond to warming here in the Nino 3 region, Nino 3.4 region. Only Krakatoa was not associated with a, a, a El Nino event, Krakatoa being the uh, oldest event, and uh, the SST are not that reliable back uh, 
uh, in the time in the Pacific Ocean. So that could be due to uncertainty in the observation, or maybe there was no any new event for this eruption. Nonetheless, uh, if you are also another point for Pinatubo, for example, that occurred in June, there were signs of a, a, an El Nino coming along before the eruption site started. So maybe we have five, uh, we have four El Nino events after five volcanic eruptions, but that could be a coincidence. We could try, we try to measure this probability using a, a, a simple, like a Monte Carlo approach and sampling uh, out of uh, four out of five eruptions for um, over the historical period. And the probability that we have an El Nino event for four out of five volcanic eruption is very low. So this is too, uh, too small sample from a direct observation to conclude anything, but there is a strong incentive suggesting that maybe there is a causal link, especially if you believe in proxy reconstruction and the work that has been done by Lee and Cother based on a 700 year long uh, Nino index. So for the physical mechanism, there were like uh, several theory trying to link the El Nino Southern Oscillation response to volcanic eruption. The first one, the early one, <clears throat> well, some part I'm missing. Well, the first one uh, invoked the, what we call the uh, dynamical thermostat mechanism that was uh, invoked uh, for the first time by uh, Mann and Quarter in uh, 2005 and Emil J and Quarter in 2008, which basically uh, states that uh, if there is a, a cooling over Eastern Pacific here, for example, due to uh, a volcanic eruption, the upwelling of cold water that occur normally here will weaken to counteract this cooling. So this weakening will basically um, favor uh, a decreased gradient between the uh, uh, zonal gradient between uh, Western and Eastern Pacific and will favor uh, the occurrence of an El Nino event. That's the early uh, theory. But since then, there were like other work suggesting that instead uh, the uh, a cooling uh, due to volcanic eruption will reduce, will increase the land sea thermal contrast between the maritime continent here in Western Pacific and uh, uh, the warm pool SST here in the Western Pacific. And this uh, uh, increased land sea contrast will like uh, f uh, weaken the trade winds, which usually go from uh, east to west. And that has been suggested as a possible trigger for an El Nino event the, the year after. And lastly, there is another theory suggesting that the cooling will be stronger following a volcanic eruption in the northern hemisphere because you have more land. So the land cools faster than the southern hemisphere that uh, has more ocean. And uh, this will induce a, sh a shift of the intertropical convergence zone towards the south. And this will slacken the trade winds and favor the occurrence of an El Nino event. So we try to explore this uh, mechanism. Uh, I, I will just maybe skip and go fast. Uh, we tested all this theory with the IPSL model. We tried, we cooled the Northern Hemisphere more. We cooled the Southeast Asia. The, we tried to, 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 to um, explore with sensitivity experiments in uh, uh, our uh, modeling framework. And we found that in fact, the mechanism was uh, completely different. Uh, a volcanic eruption, for example, if it occurs in June, will tend to cool the tropical latitudes and cool uh, the lands, especially Africa. And the cooling of Africa will like uh, uh, reduce precipitation, and the reduction of precipitation will uh, trigger planetary wave, excite planetary wave with a, a Kelvin wave that will go towards the east, and this. Uh, Kelvin way will like induce a wind anomaly towards the west in Western Pacific. And this wind anomaly will favor a zonal current that will like uh, push warm water from Western Pacific to Central Pacific. And by doing so, the uh, warm water will trigger what we call the Birkness feedback, uh, 
because you don't you need to translate this warming into a large scale response and by warming the central pacific you will alter the uh, the, um, the walker circulation and weaken even more the trend winds and this will lead the year after this is uh, the uh, weakening of uh, the walker circulation and this will like push even more the water, the zonal currents towards the west and lead to a full development of an El Nino event. So, coming back to uh, the uh, Pacific response to uh, and the decadal modulation of the climate in the Pacific Ocean. So we, we, we according to our results, large volcanic eruption can alter trade wind, modulate and so at a time scale which is a, an important thing to, 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 to note, and can also drive transient global cooling like uh, it did during the, the, the 13th century and alter heat uptake. At least that was the case in our model experiment. So to conclude, um, uh, the warming observed since the uh, 1960 can only be explained by the uh, impact of human activity at global scale, global average. Natural forcing evolve at different time scales and uh, have very different uh, climate signatures. Solar irradiance will have global uh, imprint, volcanic eruption, uh, have a strong amplitude in terms of, of radiative forcing, but their um, impacts evolve through time, uh, through uh, the impact of uh, the traveling aerosol into the, strat the, the stratosphere, and their uh, impact on climate will depend on the region. It won't be the same depending on the region. Um, the combination of the influence of external forcing with internal mole of variability uh, of the circulation of the ocean and the atmosphere will complicate the detection and attribution at regional scale. At global average, you average a zonal asymmetry, so it's easier to interpret. As soon as you go at regional scale, you have to keep in mind that the external forcing will act through the read local mode global mode of variability. So finally, the volcanic forcing is a demon cause of uh, uh, externally forced climate variabi variability at internal to the canal time scale before the 19th century. Uh, strong eruption can have, can have an impact that can last 10 years and several decades if they are closely spaced. And water vapor feedback <coughs> and uh, infrared radiation uh, in amplifying uh, the initial radiative cooling can help produce a persistent climate response for a century through uh, evolving, of course, the ocean response and its long-term uh, memory in heat content. And that's it. Thank you.